Thank you, Ren. Yes, thanks a lot. We appreciate the introduction. Um, my name is Trevor, and I'm Ryan. We and are... we're going to start quickly by placing one of these cards on each side of the audience. You can pass them around. They, uh, they work like this. Grab the white sides, pull them directly outwards, and they're quite strong. They won't tear. Feel free to pull it until the white gaps close. Yes, the, you, you won't tear it, so don't be shy. Sit that rolling. So we're, we're twin brothers, and we're artists, um, and we have um, been exploring human vision and sort of what it feels like to look out into the world with human eyes, receive the light rays that are present in the environment before you. Um, and that's led to a, a lot of conversations, and, and um, in particular, a method that allows for drawing to be captured quite accurately. Um, yes, uh, as, um, as was described yesterday or through with Charles Falco's talk and, and um, information that's covered in David Hockney's book, Secret Knowledge, there's been a few optical tools which have been used in the Western tradition of painting and drawing. Um, and those are, we're not going to go into them, but they're briefly the concave mirror lens, which is like a standard shaving mirror, um, the camera obscura, and the camera lucida. The camera lucida works by a sort of a, a reflective plane of glass or a crystal or prism is, um, can reflect both the scene that's coming from sort of in front of a viewer and then also be transparent enough that a, an artist can look through it to their paper and copy one onto the other. Right, and of course, as many of you know, David Hockney quite persuasively uh, <clears throat> explains how these, these tools were used by artists over the course of art history. Um, so we, ha we are artists um, who have stumbled upon a method that's akin to these earlier optical tools, but one that doesn't use any external optics or mirrors or, or, or lenses, um, that simply relies on the lenses that are inside your own two eyes um, that, you, that you're born with, and how those two lenses, or the two, the two images in each eye, become overlapped in your visual cortex. Um, and th this method takes a, it really takes as its starting point that human vision is spherical. Um, it's, it's a spherical entity. The light rays coming into your pupil are fanned out from that center point to be a spherically splayed set. Um, yeah, there, there, there's a lot of flat imagery out there that would, that would encourage one to think as though, it, as though we look into the world kind of through a, through a flat plane or that we look straight into the world and see things in a flat plane, but in fact, our two eyes are each an individual center point of a sphere, and we take in only the light rays that are fanned out in this arrayed formation. Mm -hmm. um, this, that realization uh, came to us through building um, this sculpture made out of matchsticks, um, which, which uh, was an exploration of emergent form, um, realizing that the individual matchstick had a wider head than a wooden stick, so if you, on a, over a sheet of glass, placed one matchstick next to its neighbor, because the head was wider, it would slowly begin to arc. And if you continue, continue that arc around far enough, it would complete the full circle. And then, as you can see on the left, additional layers were built on top, and they also began to pitch inward until it closed off into a dome. Um, this was working about an hour a day, one ring a day, it took about five months. Um, um, and the, the you know the diameter of the dome was entirely determined by the proportion of the width of the head to the width of the stick. So it was an emergent form. So while, while building the sculpture, we were considering and discussing what other shapes in nature shared that spherical formation. And there's a lot of them, like say, the entire gravitational pull of the planet all at once um, is is anchoring you know towards the core of the Earth. Um, likewise, a, a candle emitting light rays are bursting out into a sphere. And the inverse of that, your eye is extracting an, an, a, a subtended set of, of uh, well, spherical light rays. Yes, I'm gonna, so we should say that every single matchstick in the project, if you extended it, would cross straight through the center of the dome. Um, so we, we became very familiar with that, that shape of many, many rays all aimed towards a focus point. And, um, and two of the other entities in nature that seem, that seem to share it would be a candle could be floating at the center of the dome, sending out light rays, and each matchstick could imply one light ray traveling away from the source of the candle. Um, and that, that got us thinking more sort of scientifically about what is the shape of light as it fills the air. 
Um, and then inversely, we realized that the pupil of your eye could also be at the center of the dome, and each matchstick could imply one light ray coming into your vision. Um, so that, that was a major, major, major realization, and it really established a, sort of a new paradigm for us, that the, the world of light behaved and moved, light moved the air in spheres, and light was extracted by the eye in a sphere, and that light was an entirely a spherical medium. Um, and to sort of acknowledge that paradigm, um, we built this sculpture out of corrugated cardboard. Um, it was uh, hundreds of three-inch squares of corrugated cardboard that were glued together into cubes um, and that m made to curve very slightly into, a, into a, an arcing wall. And the corrugation was always aimed forwards, such that if you extended it, it would converge at a focus point about six feet in front of the sculpture. And if a viewer stood with their eyes at that center point, they could look back through the sculpture and see all of the tubes of corrugation go become open, the whole, the whole sculpture sort of disintegrated and became transparent. Um, so in this image, uh, Trevor's hand is behind the sculpture. And uh, the camera is placed right in that central focus. And the, the sculpture kind of disappears in a way. So that was like our visual proof that human vision is a spherical entity. Um, so with, with that realization, um, we felt if you were attempting to insert a picture plane in between your eye and the world in front of you, it would make much more sense to use a spherically concave picture plane as opposed to the traditional flat picture plane. Um, this, of course, you, you can see you know, if your eye is taking in spherically splayed light rays and you insert a flat picture plane, it's kind of out of sync with the shapes involved. Um, and say objects arranged in the, in, in, in the background when they're translated onto the flat plane would be sort of condensed in the middle and then smeared out as they went to the sides. Um, but if you use a spherically curved picture plane, you, you, you stay in harmony with the physics of the light. Um, so the question then arose, how might one draw accurately onto a sphere? Um, and first of all, you, one might need a spherically concave easel. Um, this is a easel that we built um, that has a head stabilizing component and mounts to a tripod, so it's fairly easy to set up on site. Yeah, the, the head stabilizer positions one of the two eyes, the left eye in this case, right at the center point of the spherical curvature as a fixed vantage. And then the, um, the swivel ability of the head stabilizer comes from this Lazy Susan, which is on the top there. I wonder if I have a laser. Um, and it's, it's the, the column of rotation is directly in line with the left pupil, or some point in the left eye. And, uh, and there's also a horizontal pivot on the side, which is also in a crosshair with the left eye. So, so you, um, you can look side to side and up and down and maintain a fixed vantage point with one eye. Um, we, we should state, though, that it was never our explicit goal to draw realistically or to draw realistically on spheres. Um, the, the decision to do so came simply from um, realizing a method that would allow us to. Uh, and that came out of a number of visions about our respective experiences of human vision um, and sort of analyzations of, of little hidden artifacts within, within your scope of vision um, that were there but you didn't really see. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, just we were, we were exploring visual art and feeling like the act of looking had a lot to do with, with what made it, say, a more or, or less exciting visual image and um, just analyzing what like what kind of um, what parts of our vision are shared across all viewers mm -hmm. and one is that we all have a nose and our noses are appear in our visual field um, on your face your nose is of course right dead center but because you see the world with two eyes it optically appears on the left and the right side of your vision and you can, you can see this by, if you close your eyes back and forth, you can see your nose jump from one side to the other. Um, so the, the perimeter of the paper here shows that nose profile. Um, <laughs> on, on the bottom is kind of the ball of the nose, and it goes up to the tip of the nose, and then hooks over to the bridge on, up at about the horizon line. And then as you arc over the sky, it goes over the eyebrow. Um, and so, the so, th so that shield shape 
is actually the it's the Venn diagram area where the two eyes see together, and it's the sh literally the shape of of one's depth perception, or at least bin binocular depth perception. Yeah. Um, so becoming aware of the nose came from doing small abstract compositions, um, where the, the the goal was arranging the shapes until the composition felt felt sound and resolved, um, and we noticed that. There was this continual, continual recurrence of um, a kind of triangular shape down in the corner. Um, and at some point, Ryan posed the idea, I wonder if that is the tip of your nose. Um, it so, seemed it, it, like when you look around paintings, it's not uncommon to find these blocky forms in the lower regions. And it perhaps is an unconscious inclusion of the presence, the, uh, the omnipresence of, of artists' nose or people's noses as they seek to make sound compositions. Right, because um, for the entirety of your whole life, you look past that shape in the, the, uh, in the periphery of your field of view. It's literally like, it's like square one. It goes it gets, with you everywhere you go. It gets, um, it gets burned in. Um, so, so this is, a, this is a, a painting by Matisse. It, there's, this, you know, the, there's this kind of nose shape in the corner. Um, and we can even take that one step further. We know that Matisse wear, wore round glasses which also would have been with him everywhere he went. And he perhaps included subconsciously a bit of the round glasses as well. Um, that, you know, the, the, the placement of the table relative to the nose, the kind of arch of, of the leaves on top, um, is, it's a bit as though his sort of internal experience of his own face is projected onto the, onto the canvas. Um, and it, th this, this comes up a lot. Like here's, um, here's a Rembrandt etching. We, we know Rembrandt has a kind of bulbous nose, and there's a b bulbous nose shape in the lower region of his etching. Um, Cezanne, as well, has a sort of nose-shaped triangle. And uh, last but not least, Morris Lewis made a whole career out of including two nose shapes <laughs> on the edges of his canvas. Um, so this is an example of one of the types of conversations that we were having that just just sought to tease out hidden elements within your field of view, um, elements that you know seem seem fascinating for one reason or another. Yeah, and um, this the, this doubling, the, the doubling of your nose, and therefore therefore the doubling of everything in front of you, uh, is 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 something that we don't really think about, but it is there all the time, and we'll. we'll Let's do a, a, a small example just to just just to, to make this more clear. If everyone will, will entertain the idea of holding up your finger in front of you and look past it, don't look at your finger, look past it to something happening in the distance. And you will notice that your finger is going to divide into two fingers. Is this uh, apparent? Um, and not only that, you, the two fingers will be transparent because the other eye is filling in that background information and vice versa. So you can kind of optically render your finger doubled and transparent. Right, and so not only does the nose split into double, but anything in the foreground that you are looking past splits into double. Yeah, so um, all day, every day, everything you're seeing everything in double, but we, we just align the place that we're focusing, we align the image from each eye, and we see that it's kind of singular. As we flick around the room, we see everything is singular, and we, in our memory, construct a singular view of the world. But in fact, there's the, the optical reality of, of uh, visual experience is that Things are always doubled. <clears throat> the question then arises, how can this doubling phenomenon be used to draw? And we realize that it works, it, it can be done like this. Um, if you take a piece of paper and insert it halfway into your vision, so it covers one eye, but allows the other to look around at the scene, um, your sight lines will be, will be doing this, and they will be divided at the picture plane, which causes the paper and the image of the pen to divide into a double image. Um, importantly, one of those images will be optically transparent, um, such that you can see the scene in the distance sort of coming through this ghost-like transparent image of the paper and pen. Um, and this, that, the second image of the pen can then be used to trace over top of objects and record all of their visual characteristics, their location, their scale, the sense of, sense of dimension perspective, exactly as they appear to your eye on the paper. Oh. Yeah, so li literally just by looking past your paper, this, this automatic optical phenomenon occurs, and you can make a tracing of how the space is being constructed by your mind's eye. 
and all like then you know the characteristics of space shrinking into the distance can be lifted immediately without any math or computers or calculations or or, or external lenses just using the internal lenses of our two eyes and how they work in tandem with, with the brain right so there are some limits exist you can only make that that doubled image about as wide as your two eyes are apart from each other so you 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 can only draw say a two inch wide margin at any given moment um, and you have to finish that that one margin slice it away with a razor blade and remove it in order to turn your head a you know, slight amount and look at the, the next margin and then and then fill it in um, um, but you can kind of go from zero to 60 and just plot with, with pen exactly where the things should be in one shot mm -hmm. um, and there's skipping linear, linear perspective or um, and then once you are done you can tape all of the tape all of the su successive margins together and create a uh, sort of panoramic capture of what the space looked like if you when you were standing there and if the viewer places their eye back at the center point of the sphere the proportions will exactly match what they what they would have been on site um, uh, yeah. Yes, yes, um, yeah. The, that's a good point. When, in order to photograph this, we had to pull the camera back away from that sweet spot. Um, and so the lines appear to be curving, but that's, that's the curvature of the surface that you're seeing. If you could put your eye back in the sweet spot, every single one of those curved lines would, would turn back into a straight line. And in a sense, every straight line is a great circle on the sphere. Mm. Um, the, the, other, the, the other quick added benefit of working on a sphere is that you can capture a much, much wider angle quite easily. If, you had a, if you're working on a flat canvas, you could have one that was 50 feet wide and it would never encompass 180 degrees. It would, you know, it would always be somewhat less than 180. But with a sphere, you can, you can quite easily wrap 180 degrees or, or further. Exactly. Um, during this exploration, <clears throat> given that we were, the, the, the root subject matter that we were trying to explore was, was human vision and the act of looking. The question eventually arose, why are we using the rectangular perimeter? Where in your vision does a rectangle exist? And the answer is that it does not. So um, this, this drawing was a, an attempt to find the natural perimeter, extend the picture plane until it hit the, the, the actual boundary of where your vision stops. Um, we, and, we used, a, very quickly, we, we used a, a green laser, which we, we, we've read that the periphery, your peripheral vision is more sensitive to green light and to motion. So we, we, we made this, this big blank sheet of paper, and Trevor put his head in and looked straight forward, and I would take a green laser and wiggle it in from the side, and as soon as he could see a dot, he would say so, and I'd place a little pencil mark, and then do it again an inch above. And over the course of a few days, we plotted out these little dotted markings, which, um, which showed the, you know, the exact limit of, of the human visual field, of his visual field. Um, so that's, that, that, that's one way of getting uh, Getting a wider perspective, or getting the entire in, entirety of, of, of one's of one's view, um, but we are now doing a, another project currently, where we're trying to where we're putting in the element of time. Um, so this is this is in process. It's it's a uh, it's being made in these vertical margins, of Central Park, and yeah. It, yeah, it's upstairs. You can go and see it. And it's we're, Central Park, New York City. We are creating it over the course of about two and a half months, and on the. On the right edge, it's still summertime. The leaves are still green. And we're, we're giving about a, a week gap in between each strip. So the leaves change, and they become more towards fall colors. Um, this, is, this is kind of in the middle. And then fall comes even a little bit more full on. Fall eventually begin, begins to wane. Um, and there are the tree. So some of the trees become, become gray as the leaves fall, and then there are two additional strips that we'll add once we get back to New York City, um, where the leaves will be completely down and it'll be the, the, sort of the gray winter open branches of the forest. Um, and then of course we'll go in and add the buildings. Yeah, which are not changing <laughs> with, with the seasons. And that, uh, yes. that wraps up our presentation. <laughs>